Thanks, guys. Well, you've heard my rattle through, whether you agree with it or not. Um, I'm sure that you'll get your opportunity to add to it. Um, we are really short of time, as, as we've discussed before. So what I'd like you to do, just to start with very quickly, is um, you're named up here, but, and if you want to explain more about you know, who you are and how you got into eSports, that's fine, but let's bear in mind that we've got very little time, and I'm going to kick off straight into the first, uh, the first question. Um, and, and what I regard as the most important one here, we've been asked about archetypes of, of the eSports stakeholders, and I want to deal with the most important one being the eSports better for the purposes of Sigma and this conference. Uh, so, and we'll start off with Arnie at the end and just move this way if that's okay. Um, the most important one, what does the eSports better look like and what products appeal to them? Who, who are these guys? <laughs> We wish we all knew, right? Um, I think, um, in general, from a target audience, from you know the the age um, of the typical gamer, I think we're very close to you know what we consider being the typical gamer. Um, it's primarily male. Um, we're seeing more and more girls also moving into games, but um, we still see that video games are primarily uh, male. And I think we have the same uh, typical uh, archetype in, in betting as well. So the typical better, um, those that also I know personally, right, are you know um, guys somewhere between 18 and 35 maybe, um, which is kind of the, the core audience also uh, in video games. So there is um, very interesting overlap. I think that's the good news um, here. And it's, it's actually very important. Um, on the other hand, um, I think there's a, um, a particular difference in mindset between a better and a gamer. Uh, gamers take uh, games very seriously, actually. Um, and, um, and we have you here, Mr. Integrity, right? Um, um, their integrity and knowing that everything is in order is very important to them. So any types of cheating or, you know, um, distraction from the core of uh, what you love as a gamer is very frowned upon. So, uh, and that's why the topic of esports betting has always been a very difficult one in the games and esports industry, and has been approached very, very carefully um, in the past. Thanks, Arnie. Sergey. Um, Sergey, we are um, Eden Esports, an international tournament organizer based in Malta. So primarily, we do online and offline esports events. So. Um, this will be a background for answering the second part of your question, is why uh, eSport better is important uh, for the industry. Uh, so tier one scene is pretty much consolidated by several big parties. And the rest of the market, they work with the second and third layer of, of the teams and a level of competition. And um, eSport uh, better is, on some of the events, depending on the scale, uh, sometimes like 50% of the audience that watch your events. So this is extremely uh, important to mm -hmm. provide a product that is interesting for the eSport betters, uh, which means that uh, you, need to, uh, you need to work on the integrity. This is the, prim the primary target for the eSport betters. They only bet and they watch the events that they trust, that they are... <clears throat> um, with good integrity, <coughs> there is uh, no problem with uh, cheating or match fixing. Um, the second key element, which not that um, often being picked up, is scheduling. Uh, now, prime time for all the eSport events is in the afternoon and evening by European time. And majority of the tournament organizers, they do events only in those time slots so that they have the maximum viewership uh, taken from the general audience and you know, just random people who will have some, times, some time in the evening to watch the event. And when it comes to tier two and tier three levels and eSport betters, they want the content to be like 24 by seven because all around the clock they, have, they need some events to bet on, they need some content and entertainment. And that's why scheduling around events is one of the key thing that you need to look at by making your product in eSport so that they have uh, the interest like match and covered. Thanks, Sergey. Vladan. Hello. So to introduce myself, uh, my name is Vladan and I work for Odin.gg. 
Basically, we are eSports, odd speed, risk management, and iframe solution providers. So we provide uh, eSports odds for betting operators. And to come back to your second part of the question, uh, who are the eSports bettors? So basically, per uh, Statista, average eSports uh, better age is 25 years. So it's so-called Generation Z uh, class. So basically, kids that were 10, 15 years ago playing video games in their mom's basements, they are now grown-up people. They are digital savvy, which means they are IT educated. Their income is higher because they work in this industry. And they live basically online lives, right? Uh, they don't go out like millennials. They don't hang out. They mostly live these online lives. So it's really important to attract them to something. Uh, and the eSports is really fast-paced. They are used to games. And they like to you know, feel that moment where they can bet and the games are really fast. So this is why I think for eSports, better live betting is really important unlike the traditional sports where pre-match is most of the, of the bets, because uh, players, uh, bettors, they are watching streams, they are watching what is cap happening in these games, and they want, to bet, they want to place their bets there, you know, when they see the action. And I think that's the, that's the most important thing to satisfy this need for them, to offer them a lot of markets in live, so they can actually, actually choose from, you know, what they want to bet on. Thank you. Yes, Dasha. <coughs> yes, so my name is Dasha Kirilishna. I work for Pandascore. Um, I'm a senior sales manager for Pandascore. It's, a, it's quite a broad question, uh, but I'm going to try and cover it from different kind of points. Uh, first of all, an, uh, from an archetype perspective, so uh, we provide um, esports betting products for operators globally. But if you look at different demographics, for example, you look at the skin gambling sites, um, they have a very strong community of esports. They, they've been doing it for a long time. So it's completely different to, to an operator, say uh, a tier one or T2 who's based around in Europe, who's trying to get into esports, build a community. So the, uh, the type of customer, it can be quite different. Um, it also depends the, on the game itself. So, for example, yes, similar to what Vladan was saying, if it's something like CSGO, a game that's been around for a longer period of time, yes, the age demographic will be quite older. Uh, when, it's, uh, when it's a slightly newer game, the age demographic can be a bit different, but also as it relates to other games from similarity points. Um, so it is quite hard to kind of pinpoint exactly because it really varies. Also, it varies dependent on the location from a jurisdiction perspective. Um, you know, everyone likes different games, just like uh, in sports betting, you know, different sports appeal in different countries. So I think taking all those points into account, um, it's, it's really quite varied across the globe. Thank you. Luke. Hi, so um, I'm Luke Adebayi. I work uh, for a, a regulated bank in the Isle of Man, so we provide uh, banking services to the esports and e-gaming industry. Um, so to take your second point from my perspective, um, we see a lot of the, the younger demographic, um, normally male, um, where we see um, potentially new clients looking at kind of corporate structuring or um, looking at banking services, for example, um, we'll normally see a bit of a demographic kind of the ages of 30 to 40 maybe, um, but also targeting that younger demographic as a kind of operator looking to launch kind of esports betting, for example. And again, um, as the panelists have said before, they've kind of been all over the world really in terms of jurisdictions. Um, and it completely depends on the, the kind of games that they're offering bets on. Um, so we might see someone that's a bit more technology savvy, savvy for example, um, coming to us for a, a banking relationship, or that's someone that's kind of been in the industry for, for quite a while, we've seen more recently. So I think probably in the next couple of years, we'll see that younger demographic looking at kind of the esports industry in a bit more of a, a more generic basis and providing kind of games and software um, and data that will really look at that kind of demographic in a bit more detail. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add to Vladan's point there. One of the things perhaps that you're not aware of, I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware of, is that every game is broadcast more or less above a certain tier, which sets it apart from traditional sports, again, particularly in leagues, where, you know, for example, if you look at the English Premier League, 
there'll be one televised game and then the rest are going on that you follow. In eSports, it's so accessible online um, and everything is streamed above a certain level. And so live betting is incredibly important in that context, which is why it is desirable. Um, but from my perspective, there's still a long way to go in terms of the products being offered live. Um, but each of you, thankfully for, for all of us, comes from a particular part of the esports industry. And so my second question really allows you, I hope, to focus in on the bits that are of interest to you, which is that what We've talked about esports betters, but what about the other esports stakeholders? Why are they important, um, both to you, uh, and how do they, what are the archetypes that we ought to be aware of uh, from an industry perspective? Obviously, with a focus here on uh, the betting industry, but more broadly, what, what stakeholders are important, and how could they possibly work together? to professionalize and commercialize this industry more than it currently is. Arnie, we'll start with you again. Yes. <clears throat> Actually, for me, it all starts with the original IP owner. You mentioned uh, them in your keynote. Actually, the, the publishers, right? They own, they control every aspect of eSports in a game. So they can you know, switch on, switch off uh, everything that has to do um, you know, with exploiting um, an eSport and, and using an eSport. And um, so from their perspective, if they are not confident in the added value of betting, they would you know, simply uh, try to um, you know, stop it or, or you know, uh, not allow it in their, in their rule books um, for performing eSports um, tournaments with their games. And, um, and a publisher is also you know, you, you have to understand that in the beginning, esports was basically, um, you know, a marketing tool to um, to improve retention of uh, gameplay, to improve um, actual monetization. Because every time uh, tournaments were being held, the um, the sales of uh, in-game items would go up um, big time. So this this was a marketing tool, and and over time, because the, the spending has become more expensive. It, uh, it became a profit center as well. And while, um, while you know, sponsorships um, have always been the main part of, of esports revenues, um, the uh, concerns of big brands going into esports and spending their, you know, uh, their money uh, uh, in, in esports instead of traditional sports, for example, would be um, huge towards you know betting and the way betting can influence um, you know how a, a game an esport is being perceived. So um, this gets very rarely mentioned. I think the the brands that sponsor esports that are important for the main revenue uh, in esports have quite a say in that as well. So that their concerns need to be taken into consideration. Thank you, Sergey. I would agree with Arne that game developers is the party that can easily influence it and make way more professional scene because they have the power, they have the rights, so they can choose whom to give the license, they can choose um, how the event need to happen, they can you know, give the guidance, everything, um, although they don't really want to do that. They don't want to get into the industry and uh, you know, start ruling it, they just want to give like sort of making a free market. So um, outside of the main um, party that can, can make it happen, I would say that TOs, um, they are the ones that create tournaments and you know, uh, creating an environment for eSport teams um, and other parties to actually compete and uh, make a living out of it. So tournaments is basically eSports, because without tournaments, you don't have eSports. And there is like no nowhere for teams to participate. So a certain association or perhaps a movement on making the events more uh, standardized, meeting the requirements, meeting the guidelines, um, uh, following the integrity, uh, sharing the information, that will help a lot. Thank you. Hi, Vladan. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree with Sergey. <clears throat> Sorry. So basically, I would say that we are all one big family, right? We are all depending on each other. Without game developers, there is no game, there is no esports. 
without teams, there is no one to play the games. Without organizers, there is nothing to play with, right? <clears throat> I think that we all together need to somehow decide how we're going to want to approach this because at this stage, and I think Sergei will agree with me, I think that whole esports ecosystem is a bit oversaturated with where we have a lot of tournament organizers, a lot of games, and it's also affecting a lot on uh, teams and players mentally because most of these players, most of, most of these professional teams, they're on the road all time. They're not with their families, and it affects a lot on their performance and their mental health. And I think this is one big, uh, big thing that we need to focus on because they are kind of key stakeholders. If there is no professional players, then the whole inter industry would kind of kind of collapse. And also, uh, as part of that, you know, endemic betting sponsors, they're also really important for the industry because they support the industry, they help the industry to kind of keep going, right, to be sustainable. And then you have also streaming platforms and influencers who are really important for the betting operators because through them, betting operators uh, are advertising to, to their users, right, to their bettors. So, all in all, I think we are, <clears throat> we are one big family. We are all dependent on each other. We need, we need to work together. Thank you. Dasha? <clears throat> yeah, so from my line of business that we specialize in as Pandascore, so uh, being a betting product provider, I think for us, uh, the main two, I guess, stakeholders or elements within the industry that are really important is first of all the trading, the, the esports traders, who are naturally huge fans of esports. They've been, some of them are ex pro players. Um, so their experience level is very key to businesses like ours, for example. They have to really understand the game to be a trader, the expertise, the experience, the knowledge, to be able to understand what they're doing, to be able to provide a good service. Uh, for operators out there in the market. Another really key factor is also the marketing side of things for within esports. You know, to be an operator within the uh, that specialises and really thrives uh, in providing a good product for their customers, their punters. You know, they really need to know exactly uh, what kind of sponsorship they need to do. What you know, what areas, what games, at what time of the year. They really need to understand and profile their customers to see patterns um, and kind of predict what could happen, you know, the year ahead, the season ahead. Um, so f from my point of view, these are very, very key stakeholders within, uh, within eSports. Thank you. Lou? Yeah, so I'm coming at it from a financial services perspective. So um, firstly, from a, a a banking side, you know, you know, operators, kind of esports teams, individuals that are placing bets need a, a bank account to do so. So, you know, uh, operator might want to receive money from their payment service providers to collect their bets and pay out winnings, etc. Um, but what we don't see is actually banks kind of being more innovative in kind of how they're thinking about new industries such as uh, um, esports. So they kind of just see it as a, a high risk industry, just like they do e gaming, for example. Um, so that's kind of something that I'd like to see change in the, in, in the near future. Um, the second one I probably would say is kind of your typical kind of investment housings, for example. You know, we see bets placed on a daily basis. There are teams that are uh, winning monies, and, and the younger demographic don't necessarily know what to do with those monies. Um, so it's kind of looking to the, the future, really. You know, I've got a, a pot of funds here where I've, uh, you know, placed a bet and, and won, but I don't actually know what to do with it. Um, so I think the next couple of years will be interesting to see how kind of financial services ramps up with the industry. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Is there, is there anyone who wants to ask a question? Because I mean, we've covered a broad swathe and we don't have a great deal of time, but I thought you know, there's been a lot said both in my keynote and here. Is there anyone who's got a specific question before I bang on with my own? OK, yeah, great. So one of the things that uh, you probably heard me say in my keynote was around this the different characters and communities in the game, but in particular how three games have come to dominate the uh, betting environment in particular, being uh, Counter-Strike, Dota 2, and League of Legends, and what I you know, somewhat dismissively described as the rest. I mean, some of these are more dominant than others, um, but 
the key question for many people in, in the esports world, and I'm sure for many in this room, is what's next? What's, you know, so, so let's look into the future a little bit here um, and predict, is there a game that you think is or should or can emerge to challenge the current um, rather one-sided environment in the betting world? Because we, we've probably got 20-odd games that count 25 odd games that count as esports, but at the moment, what is what could challenge our top three? Arnie, any ideas on that? Challenging uh, the establishment is always very difficult, and uh, this is actually something we've been looking into for many, many years. Like, what is going to be the next big esports? And we never had an answer to that, to be honest. It was in the end, always decided by the community, and whether a game like, mm, I don't know, Rocket League, for example, would make it uh, to a stage where it becomes, you know, more interesting for sponsors, but also more interesting for betting, was basically in the hand of, you know, the community. My very, let's say, rough prediction is that we will see esports going more mainstream in the future, that we also will uh, see more mobile esports, so people playing competitively on mobile devices, so the next big esports title could actually be a mobile game. Um, and yeah, which one that would be, I don't know. But uh, that would be my bet, um, that uh, it will be a mainstream mobile game that can actually change and uh, challenge um, what is big in esports right now. Thank you. Sergey? I don't know about the next uh, esport game, because you know, there are so many, and they all are now building a competitive scene inside the game even. So um, it can be any uh, in terms of who will reach the top three or challenge the top three, which I assume are League of Legends, CSGO, and Dota that so far still dominate. I would say Valorant, and I think it's, it's for a reason, because um, it's heavily supported by Riot Games. They're doing an astonishing job with original support, with running their own tournaments right now. And which is something new is that they're also open for you know, giving away the data um, to the uh, data operators and then through their betting companies. So they don't see this as a big risk or something. They are more open to it than they were at the start with League of Legends. So they learned from it. And I think that will um, support this game title in uh, the way to the top of uh, numbers at the betting websites. Thank you. Vladan, how's your guess? <laughs> yeah, I, I, would be, I would agree with Sergey. I think uh, from desktop games that Valorant is top contender because of the all Riot, Riot support. They are supporting this game enormously. But also mobile gaming is up in the rise. And in some countries, such as Malaysia, for example, mobile gaming is everything even bigger than the top three, the, top three games. Thanks. Sasha? I'm going to have to also agree. <laughs> I really do think Valorant will, well, I think it might potentially be challenging at some stage uh, the top three. Um, there's obviously, you know, I think the community kind of relates to it as well. Um, it's also, it's, we've, we've seen the numbers and how well it's doing as well. Um, and just how many people are betting, especially around Latin America. Um, it's doing really, really well, and it's, it's nice to see. It's interesting. Thank you. Luke, any thoughts? Yeah, I'd agree with the, uh, what was said earlier about it going on to kind of mobile phones. Technology is now, you know, you can do anything on your mobile device. So I think going forward, it, that will change things a lot. Um, I also think we need to kind of break the barrier with the kind of male-female divide as well in terms of uh, players. So it will be good to see how that kind of develops over the next two, three years, I think. Thank you. Well, I'm sure most of you may have noticed that nobody mentioned sports simulator games. Nobody mentioned FIFA, NBA 2K, Madden, any of the racing games, any of the fighting games. Take note of that. You've got to realize that in the esports world, those games don't move the needle. But that's not to say they don't create fantastic 24-7 betting products. And so we are seeing the emergence of these wonderful in-house betting specific products. And uh, that's not my prediction, by the way, because I, I actually agree. I think that most other tournaments are not doing 
a good job, Call of Duty, Overwatch is dead in the water. Um, and uh, so yeah, Valorant is probably the next big one for all of us, but I'm not 100% sure that's going to succeed either. Thank you so much for your attention to the panel. Please give them a hand and you get to stick with me. Thank you.